Hello, Moto America fans. It's time for another episode of Off Track with Carruthers and Bice. You'll laugh, you'll cry, and you may even learn something from this unlikely pair and their special guest. The mic is yours, Paul and Sean. Hello, everybody. This is Paul Carruthers, and I'm joined, as always, by Sean Bice. And this is our weekly podcast off track with Carruthers and Bice, where we talk about all things Moto America. And uh, we're going to be talking a little bit more than Moto America today, is we're going to be talking about Moto GP and, and the World Championships, Moto 2. Obviously, we all know Cameron Bobier is there, Joe Roberts is there, we've got Garrett Gerloff representing us in World Superbike. And the gentleman that we're going to talk to uh, here in a few minutes is uh, familiar with all of them. As uh, I'm going to find out exactly who he works for because I, I thought it was Dorn of it. I might be wrong. But anyway, Sean, how are you today? Hey, I'm doing great. I'm down, down in Florida. Took the trip down here to visit uh, my mother in law. And so we're down here and, you know, we were looking forward to some tropical sunshine. It's 65 and overcast today. I mean, I'll take it. It's still, I don't wear, I'm not wearing a jacket or anything, but um, yeah, I'm good. It, uh, it taking that trip down to, you know, we drove and, it's kind of like when we drove to, well, I've driven to Atlanta, I've driven to Barber this past year. So it's funny, a lot of the same route is um, that way. So I felt like I was going to a race in the middle of the winter here. So, um, but anyway, it's, it's good to be down here. Well, I, didn't you go to Florida just to make yourself feel young? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's right. No, it's totally that way. Plus, I, no, I figured I'd, I'd get somehow end up in the news. Seems like anything and everything that's weird happens in Florida, right? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I think, uh, you know, full, full credit to you for, for braving the, uh, the elements of going there. But um, yeah, someone told me you went there because, you know, it puts you in a, you know, a, a different age sphere a little bit there and it makes you feel young. Yeah, it's the fountain of youth down here for me when everybody, when all the other blue hairs are here. I mean, you know, I'm feeling pretty good. So, not well, bad. You know. <laughs> well, speaking of youth, yes, our guest today is, I, I, I like this kid and I don't really know him. And I call him a kid because he is, he's a British lad. And um, <laughs> I don't know how old he is, but he'll tell us. But he, he's young and he's got a cool job. He's, I guess his bio reads that he's obviously a commentator and a social media producer. I got to find out if he actually does that for Dorna, if he does that for an outside company that's contracted to Dorna, but we'll found, find that out. I like to think of him as, he's really my voice of Friday mornings. Ever since Joe Roberts and Cameron Bobier, um, you know, got started over there in Moto2, I, I do, I, I admit to getting up really, really early and I watch the live feed and I have live timing on one screen and I'm looking at their, their lap splits and I'm agonizing with how difficult Moto G, Moto2 is. And I'm one of those people that I always knew it was difficult, but this year has really given me a different idea of how difficult it is because obviously we sent, we sent Cameron Bobier over there. He's our five-time Superbike champion and we all know how good he is. And then he gets over there and it's a bit of a struggle. And, you know, Matt, Matt's eerily, or let me, let me tell you, our guest today is Matt Dunn. And he's all those things that I just mentioned, but he does the commentating for basically what is MotoGP's live feed worldwide. It's a subscription service, which is the best hundred and whatever dollars you'll ever spend. Uh, it, Cause it keeps you on top of all the things that are going on over there all the time. So he basically gets paid to talk and talk a lot. Like I always think of, um, he's almost like the younger British version of Sean Vice. I mean, you know, Sean's the only other person that I know that could probably talk the entire day. I just don't know how well informed he'd be about all the subjects that he talked about, but it wouldn't stop him. No, um, wouldn't. So this, this kid um, makes his living by telling us what's going on on the racetrack. And he's it's turned out that he's he's kind of become a fan of our podcast and he uses some of the information that we were able to get from our guests, especially when we talk to the to the Camerons and the Joes and the Garrett's of the world. But let's uh, let's bring him in and, and have a bit of a chat with him. So, Matt, how are you? I guess it's this evening in uh, in good old England. 
Yeah, it is. Uh, well, good evening. Thanks so much for, for having me, really. I mean, for a long time, long, long time listener, first time caller, as I said to you guys. And thanks for the nice intro. I really appreciate that. Um, I think uh, you and my mum must be like the nicest people when talking about my commentary compared to everybody else. Your mum's um, probably younger than me, though. <laughs> I actually know. I think she's a little bit older than you, actually. Um, oh, yeah. But I'm OK. So I'd like to clarify that I'm 28. Uh, I'm 27 years old. I'm 28 next year in March. So, well, I think by the time we go to Katara, yeah, I'll be I'll be 28. I think it's the, I think it's the fact that you don't shave and you got that baby face. I thought you were probably 17 or 18. Hey, I shave, but uh, only once a week. <laughs> so, uh, no, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, I know. I appreciate I'm quite young. I think it gives me a bit of a, it, it's useful when it comes to, to working in the paddock because it, I think it disarms people quite a bit because they just look like, oh, what's it? Oh, I'm not going to, not going to tell this nice little kid to go away. I can't do that. It's like a puppy dog. So I use it to my advantage sometimes, you know? Yeah, you can't tell, you can't tell a young kid to piss off, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And also, well, I mean, some people also, do. it's also good that it, I mean, it's such a young sport and, you know, I like to think of myself as, as a lot younger than what I am. And I, and I give a lot of credit to that, to, to being involved in a sport where the participants are all young. So you kind of, you, you sort of, uh, you sort of meet somewhere in the middle as far as, as how you interact with them and stuff. So, um, yeah, I think you're in a, you're in a good spot and man, it's hard for me to not think you're probably just living the dream. Is that correct? Oh yeah, I know. Absolutely. It's been, um, I mean, I won't lie, like the last two years have been pretty full on, like very nonstop by the end of the season when it finishes, I'm, I'm very, very tired. Like uh, the last actual week, um, it's not obviously the, the COVID and things like that, but I've had a pretty sore throat. So I was actually kind of wondering like, Oh God, because right. so, you mentioned like, Oh, do you want to come on the podcast? And uh, um, it's, it's pretty tiring, but it is obviously when you're doing it and you're looking, talking to you guys, be a bit of an opportunity to look back on the season I'm like wow yes yeah absolutely uh living the dream absolutely no question about it now let's let's back up a little bit and talk about you before we get into to talking about moto 2 etc but um sure. it, it, do you work for Dorna or is it another company that's that's contracted to Dorna uh so I, I actually technically work for myself and my own media company first non throttle media it's like it's what I had to do in order to come and live in England and still work for Dorna I was previously an employee of theirs living in Spain um, but due to the pandemic uh, family factors and you know uh, got another half as well I've been with for a few years I wanted to move back to the UK so in order to continue working I had to to embrace the freelance life um, so I work my company first in the throttle media like I'm contracted to Dorna to, to carry out commentary services and, and social media production services basically I'm, I'm essentially doing the same that I was last year but just as a, as a freelancer now. I first learned about you, I think, was right in the lockdown part of, of COVID when you were doing mm. interviews and stuff on, on Zoom or, or Skype or whatever it was. That's where I first got my, uh, my indoctrination into Matt Dunn. So. <laughs> and you, uh, did, was that because you were thinking, who the hell is this idiot they've got on their <laughs> Instagram stories? Well, with yeah, belief- I was... I was thinking, how freaking bored must I be to be watching this? <laughs> yeah, well, everybody was, right? That's why, actually, they did kind of good on the views and things like that. And uh, Yeah, it was yeah. a captive audience, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And do you know what's really funny? Full circle. Obviously, we're not doing this on video. So, like you said, in the WhatsApp messages, no one's probably wearing trousers or pants, as you guys call them, right? But <laughs> in this v- very room that I'm in right now uh, is uh, the spare bedroom in my, in my other half's father's house. Uh, in the northeast of England and this is the same room same seat and everything that I did all these podcasts and all these Instagram stories uh, Instagram live interviews with riders from in that lockdown this is where I spent it for four months so uh, yeah it's kind of full circle and that's and that's where this um, where we are now just outside of Durham in the UK it's an old train line which has sort of been graveled over um, that's part of the coast to coast route in the UK I uh, used to do, I was doing like runs up and down there, trying to keep a bit of fit, trying to keep that lockdown weight off. And that's where I was listening to you guys' podcast, keeping me sane. Ben Bostrom, Cam Bobier, Joe Robertson. It was great. So I, I thank you for the the entertainment and and keeping me, well, sane, basically, whilst we were locked up. Well, what a small world it is. And Sean, the, one, another cool thing about Matt, I feel like I'm the president of his fan club already. And it's <laughs> kind of creepy, but anyway... No, I, it's, I always, I'm always interested by youth that has a feel for history of their sport, especially when they work in the sport. It's, 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 
it's all too common to talk to a young racer these days that don't know, you know, yeah, anything from five or 10 years earlier than when they started. So Matt's, uh, Matt's got a pretty good feel of, of what's going on in, in, in the history of the sport. So it's, it's, I, I appreciate that as well. Yeah. You know, Matt, I've got a question for you related to that actually. Sure. So, so we, Paul and I, of course, and it sounds like you've got the depth of knowledge to understand about the transition from Grand Prix or GP to MotoGP. So it used to be you talk about Grand Prix and you'd go, you know, 125, 250, 500 or whatever. Well, now that MotoGP is a branded thing specific to that class, it's kind of weird when you talk about like all of that kind of, of racing, prototype racing, I guess. When you talk about MotoGP, it doesn't sort of encompass Moto2. It's weird how you have to, they're branded separately. How do you deal with that when you, you, you're you not really speaking? I guess you talk about the MotoGP be pa, GP paddock, but does that encompass the other classes as well in your mind? Uh, yeah, it, it does. It does in a way because like, um, obviously, you know, you find yourself in some social situations outside of work, like you get in your haircut and they're asking like, well, what do you do for a living? Um, right. And only recently have I started saying these, oh, I'm a, I'm a motorsport commentator. Then the inevitable questions come, what do you commentate on? And I, I, I say, like, I end up saying motorcycle racing. They're like, oh, is that like that MotoGP thing? And I go, well, no, it's Moto2, Moto3. And they're kind of the same, but one's a junior class and one's like the feeder series for it. Um, I guess, like, to the uninitiated, I guess, uh, and, and even some in some respects, the, the initiated, um, to refer to them sort of as like the main feeder series for MotoGP, I guess, is, is the main main way to referring to them right yeah it seems like that's the way to do it i mean i i, I do it that way in my head but it's weird how you have to kind of specify a little bit now yeah, yeah especially the way they they've trademarked the names like you know brand names essentially yeah exactly and like it's it's different to it's so different to what it was like back in the past i mean um like you get some you get some, I, I try and be a bit of a student of the sport. I'm, I'm a bit disappointed sometimes in some of my historical knowledge. I'm always, I, I love hanging around with, with Matt Burt, um, one of the main MotoGP commentators. And also we sit near the likes of Matt Oxley, uh, journalist in, in the media centre and those guys. I mean, just the stories they have of, of the history and stuff. I love listening to it. And I always feel a little bit disappointed in myself. That I don't know that kind of stuff already. And then that's why I like listening to you guys because you get all sorts of guests on past and present um but back in the day like the, it has changed because i feel previously the 125 series and then the the 250 series decades ago it, it could have been a, a championship in its own right where you had guys who were just he was a great 250 rider he was the 250 god and it but now murder two and murder three they are just about everybody in there wants to get to murder gp and that's it nobody in there apart from maybe a couple who have had a, sh a shot at murder gp and then moved back to murder two or diagonally i would say to murder two because it's not like in some respects it's, it's not kind of fair to say a complete step down into, into respect to some riders careers how many riders do you see these days who are making a career out of being a, a murder three or a murder two rider the ambition is just murder gp and i think that's um that's that's kind of a, a big distinction for me and what i've what i've read about previously but what, what does that make sense to you guys yeah yeah very totally. much so. Totally does. I mean, you know, it's funny. You think about, I mean, I, I, I can name specific 250 riders, you know, obviously Carlos Cardus and guys, guys like that. Um, but even, even Loris Reggiani back in the day in 125s, you would think of guys, you know, you didn't, I mean, I guess they could have advanced or whatever. And, and maybe some of them did, but some of them made their hay or made, made the sunshine when they were in those lower classes and you're absolutely right. I mean, hmm. you don't think of guys as being specialists like this. Everybody's waiting on the doorstep to go into the big class. That's, that's a really good point. Yeah. And I think of guys like, um, for example, we, like in recent years, uh, Angel Nieto, you know, I was, um, I, which he died a few years ago now, obviously. And he's one of the greatest ever in terms of his yeah. championship wins, but not premier class. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, I mean, consider yourself lucky, though, that you can go get a haircut and somebody knows who MotoGP is. <laughs> it's quite rare. Because we, I guarantee when Sean and I go to the barber, the guy's like, oh, what are you doing? We tell him. And, and he's like, is, is that where they drag their knee on the pavement? And we're like, yeah. And it's like, it's super bikes. And, you know, we, we have a lot more explaining to do than than you do just telling them it's Moto2 and Moto3 well, instead of MotoGP. But 
to be fair where i live is um i actually live in motorsport valley i live like uh, i live a, a half an hour i know you're a, you're a big cycling guy paul so i live like half an hour cycle no an hour cycle away from silverstone circuit oh, awesome. um, my, my other half she works for a motorsport agency does a lot of work in f1 and um so that's so she's off because of that having work in an office there she decides where we live i'm freelance so we, it's, it's awesome but we're right in the heart of, of motorsport valley so uh, vista city center where i live well, you guys are probably calling it by Chester because that's how it's kind of spelt. It's weird. British, British pronunciations. Don't get me started. Um, well, Matt, it's... Matt, I got to interrupt you for a minute because <laughs> that was a question that I had with the last name of Bice. I mean, when I was in, in high school, they used to call me Beister and they would spell it that way. Really? <laughs> okay, well, there you go. It probably was by Chester. So, but my name, I don't, my name is some kind of, it relates to trees or something. It's not that but what is by chester does it mean like two things actually or i i, I haven't a clue but it's around there it's rife because you got right just outside silverstone you've got uh toaster but it's spelt towcester and then of course you got leicester and all that too so it's um i don't know but it, there was a there was a joke the other day i don't know maybe this isn't going to be very good for an audio podcast but it was i saw a tweet the other day talking about um uh like british people would spell booster like your booster covid shot as um you would spell it like uh b-o-w sester like toaster <laughs> so i was like because that's that's the kind of nature of spelling we have in here it's, it's a bit silly but yeah but i live in i live in a very cool place it's right at the heart of, of motorsport valley so i literally walk to the supermarket and there are formula one jackets british superbike uh jackets wow. and, and hats no the in england there's a there's a funny cultural phenomenon thing so obviously, maybe you guys aren't, and Moto America fans aren't so big up on British superbike history, but they'll know obviously John Hopkins rode for Rizla Suzuki back in the day, yeah. right? Uh, and then of course you have Monster Tech from Yamaha. For some reason, I think it's to do with the distributor that they had, like the British Grand Prix and also British superbike races up in that period, the mid 2000s. You will see, I guarantee you, some, wherever you go in the UK, any city, any town, you go out shopping, for a restaurant, you will see either a Rizla Suzuki hat or fleece or jacket, or you'll see a Monster Yamaha Tech 3 jacket, fleece, hat wow. everywhere. I'm not even joking. That is a thing in, in England. And, uh, and and now I've said it, everybody listening, if they're British or they come here, they will notice it, I guarantee you. Well, that Rizla had that baby blue that was kind of cool. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I and mean, they, it was a nice idea. looking, yeah, it, 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 it'd be a nice looking jacket, whether or not they exist or not anymore, you know? So let's yeah, go yeah, with that. Yeah. And then I want to back up a little bit. You said something about your partner. I I yeah. I saw her tagged on one of your Instagram pages, so I clicked on her name and went to her page, kind of stalkish a little bit, which yeah, you know, yeah. I don't feel real good about. But I <laughs> want to tell you that you're one hundred percent boxing above your weight. Oh no! Wow. I don't, thank you very much. Yeah, I gotta I, see. Everybody this tells me that. <laughs> wow! <laughs> Appreciate that. Thank you. Oh, it's uh, definitely definitely much much better half. That's that's for sure. And she works for Formula One, so she's a step above you there as well. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm I'm seven years into this game, and I guess like professionally, the next year by my seventh year working professionally in MotoGP, and then beyond that, I think I've I've I was grinding away for a good. I would say I was working away three years off my own back, like all my well, actually using my student loan to fund me going to races and renting cameras, um, for three years before that. So I'm like ten years into this. She's one year and working for Formula One. Well, in like in, in formula one not at the actual promoter but like uh working work working in formula one stuff so that's pretty cool eh? yeah she's at the big show yeah 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 exactly but let, let's take a look at this for a second how how did you get to where you are as um, far as how does how did how does one get started in that these days um well being young and not asking for very much money helps everybody that helps uh, yeah <laughs> that is uh, that is number one if you um and it's sort of having at the time so I, was, I just finished university so you know 50 grand student loan uh, had applied for a, a lifeguarding job got rejected from it and then uh, also applied to be an events uh manager executive at brands hatch for like and i think they were advertising I don't know how it, it wasn't much like it wasn't really a living wage I got rejected from that as well didn't it like it got a rejection letter I actually got a rejection letter from that as I got accepted from Dorna so um I met I'm uh, I was co-running with a few people a a blog on Twitter called Paddock Chatter um I think it's under a different name now but we had like 25,000 Twitter followers at one point 
um, we we took this over from a guy called Tim Teal who created it uh, maybe 2010. And I was working on it with a few people who I've named in. I've done a, a, a couple of a couple of other podcasts and uh, spoken about this be- a little bit before, so I won't bore everybody with details again. But um, but there's like but there was a good six of us behind that, you know, over time. Uh, 20, 2011 to 2015, I was almost active on on the Paddock Chatter blog along with a few other people, um, uh, including Neil Morrison. Actually, my co-commentator wrote for the blog a couple of times whilst he was trying to make waves in the industry. And uh, because it had a bit of a following, MotoGP invited us along to Silverstone to basically do some social media, some tweets and Instagram posts about the event to promote their new campaign with Motul Oils, the, the MotoGP Buzz project, which then essentially turned into now the Motul, Motul Superfan project. Um, so I got invited to that. I was the one available, went to it. The guy who was taking me around asked what I was doing. I just finished university. He said, would you like to move to Barcelona and work in MotoGP? And there you go, ticket, off you go. Wow. So I started as a, as a social media editor in MotoGP. So I was the one in, in 2016 I was the person posting on the Instagram, Twitter and Facebook channels or me. I wasn't creating wow. the videos and stuff. I was like right. the whole web team and video production team working on that. But I was the one doing the posting as my first job in Dorna. Wow. Matt, did, cool. you, did you work with or do you know Dylan Gray? Yeah. So I worked with Dylan. Um, Dylan was the, so I worked with Dylan whilst I was working in the office 2016, 2017 in Barcelona. He was, you know, he's like, he was like, he was a bit superstar to me. I'm not afraid of being that. Like, oh my gosh, it's Dylan Gray. Like I've known of him for a few years by that point. And, um, and also we went to the same um, college. How random is that? Oh, wow. wow. Me and Dylan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, and uh, yeah, so I would see him as he would come back from the races. And, and then when he announced he left, he was, he told me just after he had went and told the bosses. And he said to me, like, Matt, you're you, like, I think you you got something, you're a bit, you got a good bit of talent, you're funny, whatever, go and if you want a job traveling in the paddock, not just posting on social media, I don't know what your ambitions are, but if you want something, this is the, he was telling me this in Valencia, go and tell the bosses now what you want and that you want to travel and you want to do things and see if you can fit in, go and do it. So I'd march right over to my then boss, uh, Mikhail Morel's um, office. And I was like, hello, Dylan's just told me he's leaving. He also told me that I should uh, should come and pitch myself for a job at the circuit with you guys. What have you got for me? And he was like, hmm, interesting. I'll get back to you. And there we have it. Murder 2, Murder 3 commentator, basically. That was what that was it, huh? That's what did it. Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I'd done a couple of um, I'd done a couple of video voiceovers. I was doing this one called Missing Missing the Apex, it was called. Uh, which is like this kind of Mickey taking piss. Can we swear on this one? Piss taking. Yeah, um, do you have to bleep that? Um, no. uh, piss, piss taking video about stuff. But you know, it was it was all it was fairly nice. I did that after every GP for two years, I think. Mm. Two years, one year, and and so they were like, oh, okay, so you can speak on camera. That's fine. And then doing Twitter tweets throughout a race, you know, you are that is a that is a form of commentary. You know, it's no it's no. It's no coincidence that actually there two is. of the main guys who do the Twitter for MotoGP now, Lewis Sudderby and Jack Gorst, they're also very good commentators. They're, they're quality. Lewis was presenting after the flag from the test. He also does some FIM Sev from Repsol. Um, Going to be called the Junior GP next year. Uh, and so does, so does Jack Gorst. He does the esports commentary. They're great because it's the same skill set. Right. Um, so that's how the, the boss is deemed off. Oh, Matt, Matt should be quite good. We'll stick him with Neil Morrison. Um I don't know how his story came about. You guys will have to interview him. And there we were, um, absolutely sweating one out in Qatar because we were so nervous. Round one, FP1. <laughs> so you you know the situation about how everything went with Dylan Gray then when he was going to be with us and and then he wasn't. Yeah. Now he's, I think, in Canada with Terry. and Yeah, yeah, beautiful wife. baby. Yeah, it's just crazy how everything changed with him. And, you know, we came so close to having him with us and he was doing a lot of research. He was contacting all the writers and it's just the shame of how, how things went. Cause we were looking forward to having him with us. That's for sure. Yeah. Dylan, my, Dylan's absolute class. There is, I don't think there's, there's very few people who have in the last like 10 years in terms of that, this media space who have been as dedicated as, as Dylan Gray is. And, and like uh, uh, him and well, anyone who steps into that pit lane role is absolutely dedicated as it gets him. And now obviously Simon Crayfar taken over from him. Simon is like equally um, just as dedicated to finding out 
anything and everything they can, you know, about this sport. And uh, it's, yes, yeah, awesome. I have so much admiration. I could never do that job. I mean, geez, like that's wild. I think that is one of the hardest jobs there. Yeah. When you've got to go talk to somebody that doesn't necessarily want to talk to you. Yeah. And well, you got to do it on air and you're doing it live. And I know Simon, you know, he, he, he was under a lot of heat there early in his, when he took that job, but the improvements that he's made. And now I think, you know, everybody loves him. So it's just, oh, yeah. you know, that if you stick with it and do your work. There was a class, um, an absolute class thread on uh, Reddit last year at some point, um, which basically just like was about 200 odd people, I think in the end, or basically um, someone started it. It was like Simon Crayfar is like, I can't believe how amazingly Simon Crayfar has, has improved from, from what they deemed he was before right. uh, at the start. And he had like 200 people underneath it all commenting like, oh my gosh, Simon is absolutely phenomenal. And some people are saying, yeah, I didn't like him at first, but now he, I can't imagine life in MotoGP without him. He's fantastic. And, and I, I almost brought a tear to Mark because I know how hard he worked to do mm-hmm. that. Like he went to, he went, I think he did a bit of media training and stuff and, but his commitment, there was no question of his commitment anyways. You're just thrown into the lines then, you know, it's, it's, it's like, like we will probably talk about later on in terms of like Cam coming over to Moto2. Does it, right. it, it just, you know, Simon Crayfar was thrown into that, into the lines then as well. That's a, that's a tough job. Much like Steve Day was thrown into lines then, uh, taken over from Nick Harris. You know, Nick Harris, such a stalwart of, of the right. paddock after he retired. And also me to an extent you know i jump in i'm something completely different i had no commentary training i um or anything like that i just i i tried to be myself whilst talking and uh, there are a lot of people which don't like that and they will tell you about that and it's uh unfortunate that i don't really care <laughs> yeah it's not for the thin skinned is it no no exactly i just i maintained a rule and i and i hope i don't know about the others necessarily um, but I just maintain a rule that if the guys who are paying my wages and helping me do this to like it, then to hell with everybody else. hundred percent. Yeah, Sean and I, that's why we don't do it because, uh, <laughs> man, we have thin, thin skin over here. Oh, very. It's, it's yeah. like, it's like yeah. transparent. Yeah. Yeah. If, uh, Maybe. if we, we read one bad comment, we're like, that's it. We're done. We're not doing it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we I should have it. <laughs> yeah yeah no, I, I get it it's, it's so fun like, I love mate I get we I get all, the whole whole range of comments on our podcast that we we've done the last couple of years like Poindexter everyone calls me like, <laughs> I've seen that I've seen that used like five times and I'm like yep no worries cheers mate so yes yeah, it's, it's pretty brutal out there so I mean yeah I just want to say like massive respect to to Simon for for like sticking with it and uh, and being just as awesome as he's a he's, he's first and foremost one of the best human beings i've ever met in my life mm-hmm. both in terms of entertainment value um and also what he does for his friends i love him to bits um and then secondly his grind and how hard he works and he wants to conquer that. he's put as much effort into this as he would have done in his racing career i'm absolutely sure of it that's right and that's why he won a grand prix hell yeah that was I was going to say, Matt and Paul, that's uh, Simon Crayfire is actually a, kind of a hero of mine because of that win he had that uh, Red, uh, Red Bull 500 back in the day there. I mean, it was, in fact, there was one time where I think he posted and I actually commented on it and he, he, he commented back, which I was like, oh my gosh, Simon Crayfire actually <laughs> said something to me. But, but I wanted to mention about Simon, it's similar in our situation, Matt, with our, uh, one of our commentators on our Moto America Live Plus streaming service, Roger Hayden, he... Okay. Um, He's, he was well-liked from the beginning and continues to be, but that guy, oh my gosh, he does his homework so much and he's, he's improved a lot and he knows he has, but um, it's just, it's, it's a, it was an untapped resource with him because he's known to be such kind of a quiet guy who speaks more with facial expressions that he does with his voice. Well, now <laughs> he's just tremendous on broadcast and we're just thrilled to have him. No, oh, I'm really glad to hear that. Yeah. Like, I think um, uh, it's, it's funny because, just because you're an ex-athlete doesn't mean you are going to be great at talking about your sport in the media landscape. That's not a given. I don't, I don't like, I love it when people would say to me like, what experience have you got in racing? You have no right. It's like, mate, just because you don't have experience in racing doesn't mean you can't talk about it. And also uh, just because you are an ex-racer, an ex-athlete in any sport doesn't mean you're instantly way better than someone who's never done it of talking about it. You know, it's, it's, it doesn't. So to actually to be an ex 
rider and to actually be good at in that media landscape, you got to tip your hat to anybody who could do that. Yeah, unfortunately, there's not a lot of them, or none of us would have jobs. <laughs> yeah, thank God, right? <laughs> I'd, have, I'd have to go race or something. <laughs> no, I'd have to. Well, but I've always said if I if I ever got like uh, booted off from a GP, I'd go be a landscape gardener, be able to spend time outside. Uh, stay fit and also i hear that it's also creative and also i, I hear you uh, get paid quite well in that so that's that's my post motor gp job or as my uh, my other half says whenever we well we don't at the moment because covid and pandemic and all that but whenever we used to go visit places like uh, um we went to edinburgh zoo on one of our first weekends together there was a guy stood in the queue uh, of like the ticket line entertaining people she just pointed to me. It was like, that's your post dawner okay. job. There you go. <laughs> so, your retirement yeah. job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right. Let's talk a little bit about motorcycle racing, shall we? Yeah, um, do it. The, we obviously, we have Joe Roberts now and Cameron Bobier in Moto2. And you spend a good part of your life talking about Moto2, obviously. What, mm -hmm. what, like if you're okay, we, we already know what Joe's capable of because he's had moments of brilliance. Um, Cameron came in as a five time Moto America Superbike champion. How did, how, or I don't even know if you would know this, but was, how did people feel about him like people that were racing with him? Because I've told him, I'm like, look, just stick with it. And those who know, know. And what you have will shine through eventually. You've just got to be patient. But what, what did they think about this guy? Or, did, or if you're a Spanish kid in Moto2, you don't care or don't know about Cameron Bobier? Um, so from non-riders perspective, spoke to a few, quite a lot of people about him, spoke to journalists who then spoke to people about him. I think it was, uh, is it, it might be, is Giacomo Guidotti. No, it was it Fran no, Francesco Guidotti, who was the Pramac racing team manager um and he is now going to ktm to replace mike liner right um he worked with cam when in ktm when he was in 125 cc alongside marquez um, oh wow and when he heard that cam was coming over again he was like you friggin watch everybody this guy wow. is special and so and what i found is um a lot of the motor gp paddock the mechanics uh, engineers and people a lot of them have been there for decades like it is the, the same people like you would, you, you guys would know this already. Like I'm sure it's pretty similar in Road America. Some of the guys who are there in the, pro, in the big teams have probably been there for years and years and years. Right. right, um, right. So people who were there when Cam was over before on 125cc, they knew how good he was. Engineers talk to each other. They look at the data. They, they saw what he was able to do on a bike. Uh, I know Sam, Cam is quite self-confessed in that he didn't quite have his, at 16 years old, he wouldn't say he was, had his eye on the ball as much as he perhaps could have, should have in that with that opportunity he was given. I think that's fair to say. Um, I think that's what he was, was talking about in the first interview I did with him this year. Um, but everybody from the engineering side and team side who heard he was coming over were like, this is going to be good. Like might not get it first year, but this will be good. That's the impression I got. As far as riders are concerned, I'm not quite sure because they're just like, well, you mentioned it. It's like, I'm like, no one knows. Um, a lot of these young riders, they don't know the history of the sport, like anything beyond the last five years. Right. Actually, some of them didn't even really know sort of who he was, but they were then would have heard five-time Motor America Superbike champion. And, and from what I gather, a few of them, they were like, this will be interesting to mm -hmm. see what he does. You know, none of them, none of them were writing him off. I know that much that, that I spoke to, but, so, but they all think, but the ones who would comment on it were like, this is going to be interesting to see what he does. Yeah, I was, I was, I was curious to see, like, you know, like a Lowe's, for example, who's been there for a while, and he's been one of those guys that's been in Moto Two, and he's, I think he's, he might even be a little bit older than Cam. Uh, he, I think he is. Yeah, he's, he's like, uh, he's like thirty now. Yeah, you just, that. you just wonder what it's like when those guys ride together. If they're, you know, you're probably right. They probably don't give a lot of thought to each other, to be honest. I bet they, I bet he did when, uh, when. Um... Uh, it was like in, in the US and stuff and Cam was up there and then the Algarve GP when, when Cam was in that top five and that. So right. um, I, I think it's, uh, and I know Rebby was, was certainly knew Cam was there in, in, in Circuit of the Americas because he was like, <laughs> he was getting really cheesed off that yeah, Cam was. Cameron felt bad about that. Yeah, yeah, because I think it was, yeah, Cam said he was like, I felt bad because I was riding like I do normally for like the top 10, but I was <laughs> up the front and you don't ride like that up the front necessarily. Like people, because, you know, they're just, 
taking chunks out of each other a bit further back. Cam would say at the back, and it's like, dude, you are not at the back. Shush. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's, so they, I think they certainly know when he's there on track. That's for sure. Hey, Matt, I had a, I had a question for Cameron that I did not ask him because I just couldn't bring myself to ask him, I think, or I wasn't sure about what he would even say because it's related to team chemistry a little bit. And mm. maybe you can, maybe you can respond to this. I got the impression that that change of crew chief early on, like I thought he got along well with that first crew chief that he had. And I mean, I think he came, I think he really thinks a lot of Stuart Shet Shetton and why wouldn't he, but this first guy that he had, I thought he was really good within the team, but then there was something going on with chemistry of that team that hadn't, to my impression, had nothing to do with, with Cam. And did you think that affected him at all during the year when he lost that first, first crew chief? Um, interesting. That's interesting. I, I'm not sure to be honest. Cause, um, uh when it, so it was it was what after portugal i think it was something like that and yeah he did have yeah yes yeah, i would say yes and no um because like actually he would he crashed in Jerez, and then le mans he nearly had his best one of his best finishes of the year in the top six and okay it was kind of a weird race things like that and then and then Mugello. so um it might have for a race or two just whilst you're literally hello new person that i've that I've not met before. Obviously, John Hopkins knows Stuart Shenton super well. I'm not sure how much the listeners of the show would know Stuart Shenton. Um, right. Obviously, like crew chief previously to, to like so Kevin Schwantz, who like and other sort of and John Hopkins, so other like American motorcycling legends. Um, really well thought of. He had been out the game for uh, a period of time. I can't remember exactly what it was, uh, but he'd never been a crew chief in in Moto Two before. So I think it's it's probably fair to say, like, yeah, there would have been a, an adjustment period. But um, for Cam, like, very early into that new relationship, he needed got he got two of his best results of the year, a, a near sixth, um, which would have been if he didn't make that mistake at turn three in Le Mans. But so did about a hundred other guys that weekend. So you got forgiven for that. And then uh, Magello coming through from probably one of the rides of the season, twenty sixth on the grid through the eighth by the end, like unbelievable ride. Yeah, I mean, it really, it really did come out. It, it really did turn around towards the end. So I just wasn't mm. sure if it, in the beginning anything happened with that. You know, I'm gonna. This sounds like I'm I'm name dropping or big time in here, but Paul and I just recently went to Cameron's wedding. We we were in Roseville, California, where he lives, and so we were there. And a time I got a question about that wedding, by yeah. the way. When, when we yeah. do it, it's still like we carry on. Sorry. <laughs> okay. That's okay. So, you know, our table, we had a good table. We were pretty close to where they were at, but next door to our table, Aton Buttbull was there along with Bob Moore, um, Cameron's uh, agent. And, you know, I know Paul talked to Aton a little bit and I did too. And one of the things I said to him, and I think you can appreciate this because this is in no way disparaging Marcos Ramirez in any way, shape or form, but, you know, personally, and I know for this, for our country, and I think Paul feels the same way, now that Sean Dillon Kelly is going to be his teammate and it's truly America, the American racing team, it's just going to be so absolutely fantastic to have those two American riders together. I mean, it truly does live up to its name, even though obviously Aton is living, you know, he's, he's not a native American, but lives in our country now. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's, a, it's a big thing for us. And I'm sure you, you can appreciate that. Right. Oh, Oh yeah, hugely. Like that, that's that's a big deal, especially the. I'm, I've really come to realise. So I didn't ask Cam too much about Sean, just because got roped up in other things, and then I suddenly realised end of the year, I was like, crap. And actually, ask Cam what's he what he thinks about Sean coming over. I didn't realise how much he likes Sean and how much Sean idolises Cam. So it's going to be like a proper little bromance next year with them two in the in the <laughs> team together, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll be a bromance until we see. And, and that was, I'm sorry, Paul, I got, I was, this was a question I was going to ask Matt further away, but since he kind of set it up, I want to ask this. So, you know, and I, we asked Garrett Gerloff this. So Sean Dillon Kelly's coming off a middleweight bike, obviously not a Moto2 bike, but a super sport bike in our series and fewer electronics, just like the Moto2 bike. He hasn't had to forget all of that stuff on super bikes that Cameron did. And I'm again, I'm not trying to doubt Cameron at all because his second year is going to be pretty cool. But do you think Sean has an advantage coming in from super sport directly into Moto2 at all? Yeah, I'd say um, I'd say he's to an extent he's he's fresher because he's not going to be as set in his ways in whichever way you decide to interpret that, like be it sort of the riding style techniques that you pick up and are now like uh, a part of your uh, they're innate to you you know you did the, the unconscious things that you do on the motorcycle um and then also 
you know, it's just he's younger than Cam, uh, it, 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 which does have an effect as, as well. I think he's he'll be fresher coming in. There's less, there's obviously less things to forget uh, and more things to pick up. The other thing is, like, if you look at Cam's riding style uh, compared to Sean's, I mean, I saw uh, pictures of Sean on the on the Calyx Matter Two already. He's got the elbow down solid and has done already on the super sport bike whereas cameron was a, a lot more of a classic super super bike rider style wasn't he so um but you know uh, sure i hope I, I well having spoken to sean off camera and on camera a couple of times with a couple of interviews i'm sure he will but i hope he still remembers like this is your first year mate welcome to the lion's den don't get ahead of yourself and beat yourself down by expecting too much to begin with because you never know he could be an advantage but it's, it's fine if he's not he's super young he's there he's got the support from the team and also his teammate in, in that case as well eh? yeah and in a way if you're smart enough about it there's more pressure on someone like Cameron not because of the superbike championship or anything championships or anything like that but the fact that he's older because yeah. you don't have you don't feel like you have the time right and yeah. somebody like Sean Dillon Kelly, I mean, take your time, kid. You'll be fine. You, you could do this for four or five years and you'd still you'd be young. But, mate, I still think the same thing applies to Joe Roberts. Oh, I took totally. Like Joe's, Joe's, Joe's 24. And Joe, right. like, said, he said to me a few times or whatever, it was his birthday at Silverstone. I was like, happy birthday, dude. And he's like, I know, 24, getting old. Everybody around <laughs> my age does that. Like, I'm, I'm one of the only people around me in my sort of circle of friends, like friends in the in sort of the industry and then private friends who don't know anything about bikes. I'm one of the only people who says we're 27, we're super young. All my friends around me think life's over. Yeah, I'm like, are you silly. kidding? And, it's, and it applies even more for motorcycle races. Like, yeah, I, I hate this. Um, well, a couple of things actually I, I want to pick up. We'll talk about them later or whatever if, you, if we have time. But a couple of things which which really great on me. I hate how the rush of the young guys in in Grand Prix and probably racing throughout, maybe probably even super bikes as well. I hate it. Like give guys, like, I, I really want Cam to do super well because he can show people like you don't need an 18, 19 year old, let them grow into human beings first. Like there are ones who are prodigies, Pedro Acosta, whatever, who are so good. They are, they're aliens. They're, they're freaks. <laughs> we can't use aliens anymore because it's not Casey, Jorge, Danny or Rossi, but we right. can call them. Why don't we call them freaks instead, right? Because that's what that's what a caster is. Um, like, okay, allow him to go. But other, let's not rush anybody else. Second thing, which I, which I, you said earlier about uh, with Simon Crayfire winning a Grand Prix, Sean. I think that's something which needs to be put on a pedestal a little bit more. Simply winning a race. If you could win a race at MotoGP level, that is that right there. Not everybody can be world champion, and not everybody should be world champion because it's. It's the top level of motorbike racing. So that's two things I'm quite passionate about. But um, back to that, I think like Joe is, he's still very young. Like he doesn't, it's not imperative. And people might think he is. I don't know whether it's like sponsors or, or himself. Maybe some MotoGP teams might think that, but I, I don't really agree. I think, I think he's still very young. Sean is incredibly young. He's basically a baby. And I think Cam's, I think Cam's still good. Like there is nothing wrong with being 28 years old riding in Murder 2. I think he's definitely still got a shot at Murder GP. And I know a couple of journalists that I'm friends with don't agree with that. They think he's a bit too old. And I'm like, no. <laughs> like, can you imagine that? Can you imagine that the headlines? Like five-time Motor America Superbike champion is now a Murder GP rider. It's gold. Yeah. Right. And I think, and you probably agree. I mean, I he'd do so much better on a Moto GP bike than he would on a Moto 2 bike because because of the things we talked about before the electronics and not having to change yeah. his riding style and, you know, bigger, more powerful bike is just more what he's used to. So I think, uh, I think if he ever got that opportunity, he'd really be able to, uh, to show some people and hopefully, you know, he keeps plugging away at it and things get better in moto two. He might get that chance. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. And I think, uh, I think um, like uh, we talk about it as well, like all the Americans at, at the world level now, they're all there because they're just as good as everybody else. And they all have the potential to be more GP riders. Like I, I, I don't believe that every single rider who is in the Moto3 and Moto2 World Championships could be a Moto GP rider someday. There are some guys who you should, you should not get that opportunity because you will hurt yourself, young fella. Right. Um, but I truly believe all of the guys who are in the World Championships now have, have the potential to, to be Moto GP riders someday. Now, don't you think the the new age limits that they're bringing in, 
I think that's good for several reasons, but one of them is something that you touched on. I think it might give people a little more patience and not mm. feel like they've got to set the world on fire when they're 15 years old. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so all for it. And I don't just say that because, you know, the people who make those decisions pay my bills. I'm so on board with it. Um, it's like the, the pressure at the moment, especially with social media as well, it's wild. Like the pressure on, and it, some people will say to me, um, have, have said to me when I've, I've had this conversation with them, it's always been that way. And I'm sure it has to a certain extent, but I do think there is something in that added pressure of your Netflixes with all these documentaries about these sporting greats and these sporting stories, and then also social media and YouTube. It, it, sort of, it's so the, the golden ticket is always in your face. And I feel that brings another level of pressure for these guys. And it's on them from such a young age. Um, let's, the, this sort of change in age limits might, will have an effect. It won't happen instantly. But I think there'll be like a lag in the effect that'll push people back. We'll see great. Your next Pedro Acosta will appear potentially in the, in the motor three world championship at 17, 18 years old, like late 17 years old, not just 16 or 15, which the current rule has been. Um, if you're a rebel rookies or motor three junior world champion, if you won either of those series and you're 15, you can go into the world championship, but that I think will not be the case going forward with these rule changes, which can only be a good thing. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, Kenny Roberts may not have got the chance to go Grand Prix racing based on his age if it was today. Mm -hmm. And that's like, exactly. and that, that's a guy that won three world championships, you know? Exactly. It's all about uh, the whole combination of whether you get to uh, kind of dart, sorry for darting around a little bit, but um, the, the, the potential and the, the actual deal to go to MotoGP is, is, is always a, a whole range of circumstances all coming together. Right. You know, there's no there's no direct line into MotoGP. It's impossible. Look at look at Fabio Quattararo. Exactly. Like yeah. So no, I, I I hope though for the American sake, like those guys, because obviously and I've I've got to know uh, Joe first, and then uh, Cam and uh, and Sean this year. I don't I don't know Garrett, but they all seem such good guys. I hope the circumstances uh, align for them correctly. Okay, now I want to go back to what your wedding question was. Go on. Oh, yeah. oh yeah, so uh, so I saw someone. Well, me and my other half were flicking through the Instagram stories. So there was a broken window. What, what happened there? <laughs> yeah, I pushed Sean through it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, it, it was weird. I didn't actually see it until after it happened, but I think it wasn't much. Somebody like touched it and it broke, didn't they, Sean? Okay, okay. Well, yeah, or you know, it was some one of the riders. Let me put it that way. And there are quite a few riders that were at that that way. That wedding, I mean, Jake Gagne was there and Matthew Skoltz and, you know, a whole bunch of our guys were there. And yeah, so <laughs> one of them did something. Cam Peterson, I don't know. I'm not sure which one, but. Um. A, he's, a, he's South African, isn't he, Cam Peterson? Yes. Yeah, that him? yeah, yeah. Well, they're, they're always causing trouble, aren't they? Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. if there's a broken window around in a South African, I'm going to go ahead and say it was him. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. But it was it was good fun, though, was it? It looked, uh, looked a good event. I enjoyed the video of Cam coming out with Shelby with a, uh, with a beer bottle in his hand already. Yeah, yeah. he's got the beer bottle. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, it was good. And the funny part is about that window was his father-in-law, new father-in-law, was a little freaked out about it because there was obviously thoughts that somebody was going to have to pay. Mm. And of course, he was. I, I think he was kind of putting it on Cameron. And and Cameron, <laughs> like most writers, you know, they have the first nickel they've ever made somewhere lodged in their. Uh, somewhere but um so the next day I, I happened i went to cameron's house i'd never seen his place and we had some time to kill before going to the airport so we stopped by there to see his place and uh the father-in-law we were out in the shed where all the bikes are and the father-in-law came out and said uh man cameron i just got some really bad news from the wedding venue and cameron i could see his face like drain of color and he said <laughs> that, that window was twelve thousand dollars and cameron's like you're shitting me and he said, "Yes, I was shitting you because the <laughs> wedding, the, wed the wedding venue actually paid for the, paid for the window and uh, and got it reinstalled because they probably had a wedding the next day. So, it oh. it all it all ended up well. But it was fun to see Cameron's face when he thought he might have to actually reach into his wallet. Absolutely, <laughs> no doubt. Even though as a five time Mo America Superbike champion, I bet he's got a bit more dough than the rest of the Mo Two field. He probably still just as tight as the rest of him, eh? 
Oh you yeah, see, yeah. You don't see him rolling around in any uh, in any flash cars like some of those youngsters do, right? Right, and he's not <laughs> he's not quite Garrett Gerloff level, right? Because oh, uh, Garrett is. Uh, Garrett told me one time when he went to Europe a couple of years ago to check out some racing and just kind of get his name out there. He he told me about an Airbnb that he found that he stayed in, and it was something ridiculous like thirty dollars a night. And I'm like, that's not possible. I said, there's no way you found a place for thirty dollars a night. And he goes, no, thirty dollars a night. And I said, well, what was the situation? He said, well, I didn't have the whole place to myself. I had this couch. And then there was a couple in the bedroom and they didn't speak English or Spanish. And I couldn't. So he said, we just communicated with each other by looking at our phones. And I said, you slept on these people's couch? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, that's why it was $20. That is but unreal. For him, that was a great find because he didn't have to spend, you know, 100 my yeah, I bet, I bet. Well, the one thing can can one thing can live it in the outside of he, lo- he loves it when I say he lives in Sitges. Um, uh, one thing uh, he's got to be careful of if if and when he moves out of his place, the landlords like to keep your deposit in Spain, and oh, you ain't God. got you ain't got any renters' rights. I've lost over three thousand euros of deposits from landlords who are just like, oh, this is wrong, and you ain't got, you ain't got a leg to stand on. So. If he's, a, if he's a man who doesn't like to part with his money, he's got to be careful with that. Make sure that place is tip top before he leaves. Well, I saw his place and it looks nice. I saw it on the on the new show you guys did, the Behind the Stars and Stripes. And uh, yeah. it looks like he's got a nice little setup. Not bad. Right? I didn't get to go. Um, Jack Gorst, who, who I talked about earlier, the esports commentator, he got to go because he lives in, in Spain and stuff. So, um, but yeah, they had a great time. I thought it was pretty. He came back, he was like, Cam, Cam's place is pretty swanky. I was like, really? Oh, there you go. <laughs> I thought the show was really well done. And you I like it. Yeah, I liked it a lot. And I liked it qu- because I think um, there's, and again, I, I, I would even call myself briefly guilty of that, but it, it really does show you how hard that class is. And I think that's good for our guys. Of course, Cameron, I saw him at the wedding. I'm like, oh man, this series is going to be good. And he's like, oh, I don't know if I did very well. I don't know. I... <laughs> you know how he is, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Him and Joe, both the same on that. On yeah, that and they're both, they both come off so well on camera. They look good. They sound good. They say all the right things, but they're funny. And you get mm. to see their personality. But I think the show was good because I think it made people realize like, look, these guys are, they're, they're, they're good. They're just... They just need a little more time, and that that, that then make you. Yeah, that's music to my ears. That's that's perfect. That's exactly what I wanted to do with it, essentially. Well, that's good. Sean, what else do you got for Matt? I got. I have two two questions now. Let me just fire them off here. So the first one, um, Matt, since you're British, I don't know if you know the concept or I the idea of throwing up a softball for somebody. Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, I, I, are... I do plenty of those. Okay. Well, people are gonna going to think I'm doing that but I I really do want to know um so is is Wayne Rainey's dream being fulfilled are you seeing is Moto America putting our riders more on the map over there I mean obviously we've got some guys going over but you know is there some awareness of Moto America in in your realm a little bit I guess is the question uh, yeah, I mean that's with simple simple correlation of if there are more Americans coming over, um, right? They're, they're they're good enough to be there. There's 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 no such thing. Don't I hate the comments of people saying, oh, it's, it's a passport gig or whatever, and it's, it's put the the token Americans or whatever like that. That doesn't exist anymore. It's it's the the championships are too good for that. If you're not good enough, you're not there. Um, and if they are good enough, it's because Wayne's doing such a great job over back home. Simple yeah, answer, right? I mean, there was a time. I mean, you, you, I'm sure you you know who Josh Hayes is. He did race, yeah. you know. So you know, Josh, you know, was the one that a lot of people pointed to. His career got a little bit started later, and he finally got a superbike ride later. And you know, but what he did when he raced um, for Tech Three, I mean, he mm. did a good job. And it just during that time period, the the or the series wasn't, I guess, what it, we didn't have Wayne Rainey. I guess that's part of it. So <laughs> it was unfortunate for Josh. Didn't Josh, uh, he topped the warm up session in Valencia, didn't he? Yeah, he sure did. And, uh, yeah, and they were joking. I remember the commentators at the time were saying, like, he's going to print off that PDF and frame it for his house. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, and I hope he did because that's awesome. It's, just a, it's, not, it's not just a warm up session. It's, you know, good for you. That's just cracking. So, yeah, I can, I can understand that. I always put a lot of importance on that warm up session, though. Mm. <laughs> to me that's like that's those guys like this is what i'm going to be racing today and you know 
this is how fast I can go at race pace. For some reason, for some reason, um, last couple of years, well, last year it was because of the calendar difference in, in times, but for some reason, like last two years, warm ups, I, me and Neil uh, commentate on the warm up sessions and they kind of sucked because, like, there was one reason, like, maybe there was some fog, the the, the temperature of the, of the track surface is so different that everybody, every time it was like, well, every, ladies and gents, this is going to be a pretty useless session. Oh, um, yeah. So we're just going to do a recap of the weekend. Right. But, yeah, pr- previously they're pretty good. They're pretty indicative of what's going on, aren't they? But yeah, it's almost like if a guy year, was, was fit, if a guy was fifth in warm up, he was going to finish about fifth in the race. Exactly. Um, yeah. But now it's it's kind of a strange one, isn't it? All right, Sean, you got one more. Yeah, the other one I've got. So this this relates to kind of the paddock in general, and it's kind of wondering if you you know comparing notes between you, Matt, and what we do over here. I'll give you an example of this week because it's Christmas week. I'm doing this story about this sort of quote gift exchange between the riders. So I I divided all of them up and let them know, hey, you drew so and so's name. What would you get him for for Christmas? And obviously the idea is you can get back at him, right? And kind of have gag gifts or whatever. And we're, I'm doing a story on it. But as is the case with everything that we do, especially with our superbike riders, it, there are some riders that are just more than more than willing to help, and some that just aren't. I mean, mm-hmm. they don't—they're riders, right? They're not normal people. But plus, it's sometimes hard to get them to to participate. And we've—I've t- talked to Michael Hill about this before with regard to World Superbike too. And you know, he he talks about how within World Superbike they have sanctions if they don't get involved. Do you struggle dealing with riders sometimes getting them to do an interview or or talk to you or get some information from them? Uh, I would say get information from them is the most difficult. Um, this is why um, I really enjoyed. This is kind of why, like, I really pushed to to do the the project of interview of doing a series with with initially just Joe and then cam and joe um because um because those guys are honest um getting stuff out of other riders oh my god it's just cliche after cliche there's a real there's a real <laughs> issue to an extent in in uh, but I've, it's not just mo gp so it, uh, i hope no one thinks i'm just uh taking a dump on them but um it's the same it, it can be quite similar in formula one and and another sports spell people just talking in cliches like oh yeah i'm going to be trying my 100 percent. well yeah of course you are <laughs> like, right. okay, you know and so getting stuff out then is really difficult um uh but then that is also the 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 game of the interview isn't it as well um uh, but other writers they they can if you what i find is if you if you pitch them you're doing something different with them and it's kind of cool like some of the pre-events uh the little you know build-up events publicity ones if you're doing something different and cool and giving them a worthwhile experience like there's a couple of times this year the riders got to teach uh influencers or youtubes or famous people how uh on the avale bikes right the riders actually really enjoyed it and Mm. they 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 had a good time but if it's something else like just come and shake hands with this person they can be a little bit more like i'm not really bothered buddy and uh, yeah. it can be a bit more difficult, should we say? Yeah, it depends on their fun level. Yeah, yeah. I had uh, so this year two two riders who are really good. Well, this is why I enjoyed a podcast because um, you, if you sit a rider down for half an hour, if you can actually negotiate with a press officer to have a rider for half an hour, because normally they're like no, because um, <laughs> half an hour is such a long time. Sorry, I'm sapping your life away from you. Um, <laughs> uh, the, the if you can actually sit them down and you actually ha- then have a conversation, you talk about memories from their childhood and stuff. They're actually good company and they're actually good guys. Dram Mir is a fantastic example. Me and Fran did a my, my co-host of the podcast. We did a, we did an interview with him at Mizano one for the podcast. Half an hour, he was great and he gave us loads. He talked about his struggle and how like every the the pressure's off now. He's a MotoGP rider to an extent, or every time he feels a pressure, he remembers coming through in the junior series. Because when he he didn't come from money, so he had to win. He was win or bin. Because if he didn't win, he wasn't going to get a ride. Right. And so he's like, every time I have pressure, I remember that. But he only gave me that because it was in a podcast, half an hour talking. I interviewed him when we went to the Williams F1 headquarters and they were meeting the esports guys and like getting a look at the museum. And we do at the end of every event with Dawn of Cameras, if you're there, you do a, a quick interview with them for like motorgp.com or for broadcasters right so it's real just tv stuff he, he was like useless <laughs> he was absolutely rubbish i didn't feel like he enjoyed it at all yet actually speaking to him off camera he clearly did you know so uh they're, they're funny they're funny like uh, for like for, for you guys as well the your riders too um cam is just uh, doing interviews with him this year 
as you said, perpetually afraid that he doesn't come across well. And he kept to saying, Do you make me look good, please. I even put kind of take the mick out of him at the end of the whole series. The last line in the series is him walking off camera in stitches and going, I really hope you guys make me look yeah, good. Um, <laughs> so it's just, uh, and also there's a bit in there where he's like, can you tell Matt to just leave the eating part out just to kind of take the mick of it? And uh, so he was scared of that. And then Joe, Joe is, um, Joe is fantastic at interviews. I've not heard from him whether he's watched the series or not. Um, like I, I hope he, he hasn't felt like we did right by him. Um, but like, he's great at interviews. He will be totally honest with you and really open up. But my God, he is always late for the interviews. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> so he's just classic, like laid back surfer dude, Californian. So yeah, uh, but <laughs> if that's if that's all I have to worry about with those guys, then then we're pretty good, eh? Yeah, we're training them well over here, so they can go yeah, over there yeah. and you can have it easy, you know. We're trying it's the, anyway. <laughs> it's the Carruthers and Bice Media School, that's for sure. That's right, <laughs> free, free of course. <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> absolutely. I, yeah, dude. So no, it's it's great. You've you brought up two really, really great guys. By the way, well, something well funny. As I was doing a bit of research um for old footage of like Joe when he was in in Moto 2 first year. He is his accents turned more American recently. I, there was this interview I did with him at a test in Magello 2018. No jokes, he had the most transatlantic accent ever. He actually sounded a little bit like I'm talking to you now. It was really funny because but of course both wow. his parents are British, right? Yes. Right. But it's funny how his accents changed. I didn't know that. Not told him that, actually. I should send him the link and be like, listen to your voice. Hilarious. Funny. Wow. You think it would go the other way. That's I know, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right, boys. Matt, I, uh, this has been fun, and, and we'll have to do it again. But I appreciate you. Uh, well, you're not staying up too late. What is it, almost 8 o'clock or something? Yeah, 8 o'clock. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to go and have a, have a gin, gin and tonic before bed. There you go. <laughs> All right, and then make sure you get up in the morning and run because I, I will see it on our uh, Strava. Well, the th- there's a thing behind the stars and stripes killed my training for a, for a whole month. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get back into it. Uh, yeah, um, go ahead and blame America. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> no, I, I will do, I'll tell you what, before we go, I will do a plug. Uh, it's on MotoGP.com at the moment, but it will be on MotoGP's YouTube channel sometime in January. Um, I really hope people get to go and watch it and not because I made it literally just because the message is that you have four great guys. They are good enough. They have shown they're good enough. And I really hope you, you continue to support them and get behind them even more going forward. Cause they're all, all great fellas. Yeah. I watched them uh, as soon as they came out. So well done there. And, and again, like I mentioned earlier, I think it just really shows that uh, how difficult things are over there and that these guys will, uh, these guys will persevere and they'll have success. Exactly. Even this year's champ had four pretty rubbish years. So well, one thing I do, I, one thing I, I did like to rub in Cameron's face was I got the crash stats and he crashed 17 times in 2021 yeah. and actually made the top 10. So I sent <laughs> that to him and I just said, brah. And he got back to me and he goes, yeah, it was a really quote unquote fun year. <laughs> but he, he, same, same crash, right? Every time. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I don't think, I think he, I don't think he's crazy. I don't think he crashed 17 times in his Moto America career. That's what he said, right? He he would normally crash three times a year there. That's max. That's about it. Yeah. And it's just like there, it's just, and I told him that early when he started having the crashes, I said, well, other than the fact that it's not fun to do it, don't worry about it. Cause it's like, it's it's like a a badge of honor over there to throw the thing down the road, at least, you know, a couple of times a weekend. Right. Mm-hmm. exactly i feel sorry for shelby because like she's never been used to seeing cam crash so much right as hard enough as it is you know so uh, cam's yeah. all right he just gets up shrugs it off he's wearing alpine stars he's good yeah okay <laughs> so, you two yeah. thank you very much and uh both of you have a safe and and happy holiday and we'll talk again soon very christmas fellas <laughs>